Open the door, police! Open the door, police! Here's our second look at Australian radio pirates that made the news. On with one or two from New Zealand as well. If you haven't already seen it, check out the first part on pirates in the 1920s to the 1940s. This time we're up to the 1950s. It was a time of full employment. Australians were making homes after the war. People were updating their radio sets. Some had two or more, with a radiogram in the lounge and a mantle radio in the kitchen or bedroom. Transistorised car and pocket radios were just coming in for the rich kids. With all this updating, there is lots of unwanted parts from the 1930s. One or two receivers could be made into a crude AM transmitter if you knew what you were doing. And World War II disposals gear was still big. As you saw before, this gave many pirates their start. The main cities had television, the one-eyed monster, by the end of the decade. Interference from pirates was a big concern. TV was big business. Anything that spoiled reception was hunted down. Every now and then, a curious teenager would write into Radio and Hobbies magazine asking about plans for simple transmitters. There'd be a short stern reply about the illegality of piracy and the need to get an amateur licence. That didn't stop some, as you'll hear from their stories extracted from Trove newspaper archives. How's this for some accidental piracy? In 1950, people were still using homemade receivers. One located in Melbourne's West Preston was an accidental transmitter interfering with aircraft communication at Essendon. It would retransmit the station to which it was being tuned until it was tracked down and pulled apart. Pirate Radio made good in this story from far north Queensland. Frank Moody from Cairns repaired war surplus transceivers to form the Air Ambulance Network for remote homesteads in 1947. The PMG, that's the Postmaster General's Department, took a dim view and wanted it shut down. However, it saved lives and the network was legalised. Radio dealers had to take down the addresses of those they sold receivers to. This was to assist enforcement of radio licences where the PMG cross-checked lists. Dealers hated acting as government spies and petitioned for the rules elimination. There are frequent warnings that authorities were in town door knocking homes checking for radio licences. In 1950, householders had to have one licence per set, costing £1 per year. Additional sets incurred a 10 shilling fee. Fines were typically £3 if you didn't have a licence. By 1952, with inflation, the fee had changed so that £2 covered all the radio sets in the house. So it was dearer if you had one set, but if you had lots of sets, then it might have been cheaper than before. When a radio pirate gets busted, they may be made an example of. A Melbourne man was fined £20 for pirate transmitting in July 1950. The PMG put out a warning that appeared in newspapers across the country. Note though that some headlines sometimes confused radio pirates with hams who were legally licensed. Many pirates go on to become legal amateurs. Did this happen to a Fred Caton of Maryland's New South Wales? The PMG first became aware of an illegal transmitter in March 1952. In October 1953, 
they traced it to Caton's house. Through a hole in his house wall, Caton was seen talking to an amateur in New Zealand. The PMG said that pirates could interfere with aircraft communication. That was backed up by the sensationalist headline. However, nothing in the article said that this defendant was causing interference. Caton pleaded guilty for unlawfully using a wireless transmitter. He was fined eight pounds. PMG inspector George Edwin Riley added that Caton had some capabilities that could enable him to study and obtain an amateur license. Caton said that he was very interested in radio. He said that the temptation was there to use it, and once I started, I could not stop. Caton said he could pass the technical exam, but had difficulties learning Morse code. Now, of course, very soon after this, the authorities introduced the limited license, which allowed communication on VHF bands without having to pass a Morse test. Nearly 20 years later, a novel two-element HF tri-band beam antenna was described in Electronics Australia magazine, October 1973. Its author, Fred Caton, VK2ABQ. Could this have been the same Fred Caton who got fined in the 50s? Anyway, the VK2 ABQ antenna proved super popular. It had no traps and a smaller turning radius than a regular two element Yagi. It did this by bringing the ends of elements close together, with coat buttons acting as insulators. The same critical coupling technique inspired Les Moxon, G6XN, who refined the concept further. Racing and betting have long had their share of shady characters. Before Australian state governments set up their own TAB betting agencies in the 1960s, the industry was full of effectively pirate bookmakers, known colloquially as SP bookies. In this game, information is money. Any tool to get it better and sooner than your rivals was embraced. That included radio. SP bookies Lawrence John Engel and Donald Harold Wallace, both of Cronulla, were fined £50 for using a transmitter in an unauthorised manner in 1955. They were reported to authorities by amateurs. The claim was made that if the transmitter was operated the previous weekend, it could jam hams who were providing flood communications. Late 1960s newspapers often reported on the pirate radio situation in the UK, where the BBC had a monopoly on broadcasting. Unlike Britain, Australia had a dual system of government and commercial stations, and broadcast pirates were rare. But there were some. Newcastle, north of Sydney, had a pirate station going by the call sign 2CB. It operated on 1650 kilohertz, just above the AM broadcast band. Music was played and the station made DJ announcements and time calls. 2CB was operated by someone who knew what they were doing and only came on sporadically, making them hard to trace. Two years later, Sydney University students tried offshore piracy as part of a stunt. The station, called Gloria, was on a 75-foot schooner anchored 10 miles off Sydney Heads. Gloria transmitted on the shortwave frequency of 2040 kHz, a frequency only rarely available on domestic receivers. Nevertheless, it was complained about by a commercial station. It wasn't on the air for long due to antenna troubles. A more enduring New Zealand pirate started in December 1966. 
Radio Huraki beamed commercial programs across New Zealand. It was stationed in the Huraki Gulf, just outside the three mile limit. 30 advertisers had backed the station. Previous difficulties included its antenna toppling into the sea and the modulation transformer failing. The New Zealand government recognised demand for Haraki's programs but couldn't condone the station. It had a year of regular transmissions before running aground, but it was soon back on air with another vessel. Across the Tasman, a Gold Coast business group were, in March 1967, planning their own offshore pirate station. Mr J.K. McCarthy hoped the transmissions would commence from a vessel seven miles off the coast. Backers of the venture were disappointed by the government's decision to award the Gold Coast Commercial Broadcast Licence to a New South Wales group. The Australian government was in a panic given the New Zealand and Gold Coast ventures. In May 1967, they sought to rush in legislation to clamp down on offshore pirates. This legislation was not as comprehensive as the UK laws, but was considered adequate. It had reached the Senate by August 1967. A successful opposition amendment provided for those charged under the law to have a right to be tried by jury. You'll notice I haven't said much about non-broadcast radio pirates, especially in the 1960s. They definitely existed, but reports via trove are scarce. I think much of this is because the more recent you get, the less likely newspapers consent to having their archives on trove. That includes papers in the main Australian cities. That's it for 1950s and 60s pirate tales. If you've got any more, then please share them in the comments below. When I go QRP portable, I leave a lot of stuff at home. But there's one thing I always take, and that's my Haverford squid pole. Available in lengths from three to 10 meters, they're ideal for portable, amateur radio, shortwave listening, and CB. For more information, visit haverford.com.au. That's haverford.com.au. And in an exclusive offer for VK3YE viewers, put in VK3YE as the discount code for polls delivered within Australia. haverford.com.au. Browse their range today and see if any appeal.